Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this webinar, Trustees on the Front Lines. I'm Amanda Vasquez, and I'm the director of the Dubuque County Library District uh, based in Asbury, Iowa. And I'm here tonight as the chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Iowa Library Association. The Intellectual Freedom Committee uh, provides direct support to librarians who are dealing with material challenges or other types of challenges in their libraries. We do research. We are a, a listening ear. <laughs> we And we like to do uh, continuing education like this to help libraries, librarians, library trustees know how best to serve their communities in terms of intellectual freedom and privacy issues. Uh, I want to do a quick plug before we get started, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat. But first off, I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to plug the Merit Fund, which the Merit Fund is. Uh, it is an effort by and affiliated with the American Library Association, not the Iowa Library Association, but what they do is they provide financial support to librarians who are dealing with um, loss of income or legal fees uh, after suffering ramifications from uh, intellectual freedom issues in their communities. So you, in a usual year, the Merit Fund has one recut, one request from a librarian. So far this year, there have been nine, and the fund does not have enough money to fund all of their requests. Um, I heard from a staff member at the American Library Association just a couple of days ago that the money from the Merit Fund to the most recent recipient went to paying her mortgage because she's lost her income after dealing with uh, a challenge in her community. So if you feel so moved, we would be uh, happy to have you contribute to the Merit Fund. Um, I think that's all I had to say about me, about the Iowa Library Association, about the Merit Fund. So next I'm going to uh, introduce our presenter for this evening is Ann Mangano, who is the Collection Services Coordinator. And I'm going to spotlight Ann and let Ann share her screen and get going for this evening. Okay, does that look good? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I'm so happy to be here to discuss this very important topic with all of you. Thank you to ILA and the Intellectual Freedom Committee for having me. And um, I also just want to thank Robin Putzold, who's a member of the Iowa City Board of Trustees. She pushed me to do this presentation in October at the ILA conference. And it's just a privilege to be able to have a colleague that supports the work that you do. So as Amanda said, I'm Ann Mangano. I am the Collection Services Coordinator at the Iowa City Public Library. What that means is I oversee technical services and collection development in the, at the library. Just to reorient ourselves about the Iowa City Public Library, we have about 260,000 items in our collection, which we purchase about 32,000 items per year, so we're bringing in a lot of materials. We have cooperative agreements with our neighboring libraries, Coralville and North Liberty, to offer overdrive and other digital content. And we also have subscriptions to Hoopla, which is over 1 million items, and Canopy, which is another 30,000. So there's a lot of collection development layers that we think about when we're concerned about intellectual freedom, at least at my library. And I hope that, and then a lot of you have those issues too. So today I'm gonna to talk about intellectual freedom and what your role is as a board of trustee member in upholding that important tenet of public libraries. We want you to be ready if an intellectual freedom challenge occurs at your library, because these situations can feel incredibly quick and they're chaotic and they can be very difficult. And when you're weighing the value of a book or a program and how that might specifically meet your policies, it feels like it should take some time and consideration, that thoughtful approach. But because these situations can feel like there's a great deal of pressure to do something right now, it's just best to be ready. So hopefully we have some tips for you to feel prepared. So today we'll talk about what is intellectual freedom, why it's important, ways a challenge can manifest itself. It's not just a book ban. And as a board member, what is your role? 
Understanding your role and ways to be prepared can go a long way to ensure best practices are followed and your library speaks to its value as a public service and keeps its institutional integrity intact. So this presentation is geared to uh, board of trustee members, specifically those on an administrative or governance board in the state of Iowa. If you're from a board that's an advisory board, welcome, there's two in the state. And there's some good information here that about ways you can advocate to make sure an important value of our institution is upheld. If you're from out of state, um, I rec thank you for coming. I recommend uh, just touching base with your state library to make sure that this, these things apply to you. And if you're a library staff person, also welcome. Hopefully this information will be helpful in preparing and training your board. So let's just start with some basic concepts. What is intellectual freedom? We can throw that term around a lot. So public libraries hold up an important democratic value, which we call intellectual freedom. And what it comes down to is just as an American, you have the right to seek and receive information without restriction. It's your freedom to read and explore and engage with ideas. This right is guaranteed by the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. And what it boils down to is if someone speaks, someone has to be there to listen. So if someone's writing, someone has to be there to read. The State Library of Iowa's trustee handbook states that you, your role on the library board is to protect and defend intellectual freedom. That's the quote, protect and defend intellectual freedom. Another way to look at it is a, it's just opposition to censorship. At a professional level, as a librarian, uh, your staff in your libraries that you govern subscribe to an, a code of ethics through the American Library Association. They subscribe to the Library Bill of Rights and the freedom to read and freedom to view statements. We look at these when we're creating our policies, making sure that we uphold those things when, in our practices. Overall, these statements say that libraries should offer a diverse collection provide others, and provide other services that meet the needs of the community we serve, the people in it, their interests, that can mean different formats, different age groups, different religious, political, social, and economic viewpoints on important issues of our time. Collection development is often what we talk about when we talk about intellectual freedom. So that's what we collect and why we collect it. But really the more overarching issue is access. Making resources accessible to our patrons includes the collection, but it can also include the internet access, the computers you have at your library, it can include databases. So the online resources you offer it can be the programs that you put on in the library or the displays you put up. It can also mean just providing meeting room spaces for your community to meet. And then if you offer a bulletin board to, for your community members to place thing, to place bulletins or posters on, that can also be an intellectual freedom thing. It can also go into who can get a library card at your library and what they can check out, what they can access in your collection. Are there restrictions on digital resources? All of those things are really what we talk about when we talk about access. Another important aspect of intellectual freedom is privacy. In order for people to seek and receive information freely, they have to be able to do so without scrutiny. Iowa Code considers library patron records confidential, and that's specifically in Chapter 22.7. That means the information sought, so that's the reference question you want um, your staff, oh, sorry, excuse me, the information that they sought uh, or the book checked out. If you're tying that to personally identifiable information, such as the name, address, or phone number, that's all confidential. And it should only be released to a justice agency through a subpoena. And there are very specific benchmarks needed for that subpoena to be granted. And that's in that Iowa, that Iowa Code Chapter 22.7. So that's why we work hard as librarians to try to collect only the information we need from patrons and then get rid of that information or delete it when we no longer need it. Now we'll move on. <laughs> Why is intellectual freedom important? Uh, intellectual freedom is a cornerstone of having an informed citizenry. That's why we have public schools. That's why we have public libraries. The State Libraries Trustee Handbook states that, quote, if people are restricted from obtaining information from all points of view, their ability to be informed citizens is diminished. 
and thus they cannot exercise self-government, end quote. Those are pretty lofty aspirations, but if I have to be more practical with you to, to get you on board on intellectual freedom, the United States Supreme Court has upheld several cases protecting intellectual freedom, describing it as well established. There is a great overview in a book called Protecting Intellectual Freedom in Libraries by Sharon Altman, who goes into these cases in detail. So if you um, would like more information about that, I re recommend that book. I, we will be sending out a list of, and of all the things that I reference in this collection. So don't worry about writing that book down. We'll get you a list. And then if we can get even more lofty, I want to point out that as Iowans, we should be incredibly proud of our intellectual freedom heritage. I mentioned that as a professional librarian, I subscribe to a professional code, which is the Library Bill of Rights. In 1938, the director of the Des Moines Public Library, Forrest Balding, first presented the idea for a library bill of rights to his board of trustees. So he was very worried about censorship issues as well as the rise of authoritarianism abroad and wanted to guarantee specific rights to the patrons of the Des Moines Public Library. It was adopted by the board. He was a director during World War I and in during World War I, libraries took books off the shelf, whether that shelves all the time, like if they were German books, books in German, or um, books about socialism, labor issues, uh, he, they removed things based on what the US government told them to do that. And he didn't wanna repeat that for going into World War II. I recommend a book called American Midnight that, get, that just came out that gets into um, what was happening dur during World War I and gives some context to Forrest Balding's uh, for, um, Library Bill of Rights. And a year later, after he, the board accepts it, at, in 1939, a fellow librarian presented Spalding's document at the ALA's national meeting, and it was adopted as the tenets of librarianship. This is taught throughout the country to aspiring librarians and library workers uh, from Iowa to California to Massachusetts. It states that librarians should maintain a diverse collection that meets the needs of the communities they serve. And materials should not be removed because, just because someone disagrees with them. That we should challenge censorship as librarians. That we work to ensure free expression and free access to ideas. That everyone should be able to use the public library. Everyone should have the right to use meeting room spaces or display spaces. And privacy and confidentiality need to be protected in library use. Those are the main tenets of our profession. They started right here in Iowa, and it's our calling to uphold that legacy. That leads me to what you might face in upholding an intellectual freedom issue. And before I do, I think it's really important to say something. Challenges to intellectual freedom can come from groups or individuals from any part of the political spectrum. And on a variety of issues, our society is incredibly complex. Our society is very diverse and people feel passionately about the issues that are important to them. And those passions can be opposing even a specific community. I have to say that because I'm a librarian in Iowa City. My issues with my community of what, what books are in my collection are gonna be very different than somebody else's in Iowa coming from a more a community that's considered more liberal. We do get questions about our collection. So the one we hear most about, which I just referenced are book challenges. An unprecedented number of book challenges happened last year in both schools and libraries throughout the country. In 2021, which is the most recent statistics, the American Library Association documented 729 challenges to almost 1600 book titles. Some of those challenges were just a list of 500 books. I believe there's a library in Idaho that had just a list that someone brought to the board that was 500 titles. So that's why there's less, there's more book titles than actual challenges. So it can be um, overwhelming. <laughs> a book challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict access to items in the collection based upon the objections of an individual or group. One statistic that I thought was really important from the ALA report that I want to share with you is that 18% of book challenges were initiated by board members or by a school or library's administration. So you may actually encounter a challenge from one of your colleagues. But there are lots of other types of challenges in the library. Uh, 
Programming is a big one. This is an attempt to stop or restrict a specific program that's held by or sponsored by the library. An example really prevalent in the news is Drag Queen Storytime. Meeting, rooms, meeting room use challenge. If your library provides space that community organizations or members of the public can book to hold meetings, meeting room challenges may arise if someone is upset that a specific group is using your rooms. An example in Forrest Balding's time was the Communist Party of the United States. If you offer exhibit or display space to, um, this is an attempt to have a specific display of books or other materials on a theme taken down or moved to a different location in the library. A big example is a pride display. If you have a community board challenge, a community bulletin board challenge, if the public can post notices or advertisements for community programs, someone might also take issue with something the public posts. And sometimes they'll just tear it down. That happens sometimes in New York City. Internet use challenge. If, well, there's, you know, a lot on the internet. And if you don't filter, there's all sorts of things and people might be upset by what a patron is viewing. It can be pornography, it can be violence. It can be as subtle as Facebook or other social media. Some patrons may not like the idea that somebody is using public space for them. I mentioned that because that also happens here at ISA. <laughs> so we talked about what intellectual freedom is, why it's important, and how intellectual freedom challenges might come up to you, might come up for you. So now let's talk about your role when these issues come up. The first thing, and you're starting very well right here, is to be prepared. It's not advice from me, just me. It's from the ALA, United for Libraries, and the State Library of Iowa. And the most important thing to do to be prepared is to know your policies. If there's anything that you come away with from this webinar, it's policy, 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 policy. One of your five responsibility at, abilities as a board of trustee member is to develop and adopt policies for the library. The State Library of Iowa's trustee manual says that these policies are quote, public policies for a public service, end quote. So how do we serve our entire community and make sure we are transparent about what we do when we make decisions about the library? Policies should provide clarity and stability to how a library operates, which provides evidence of normal practices. They give a reason to a library's actions and they inform the community about the library's values, goals, and intents when approaching an issue. It helps disarm critics, especially if they think that a decision that you are making or that your staff is making is made arbitrarily. Once adopted, these policies are carried out and communicated by your library staff. And when they're approached by a member of the public, they will refer to these policies if a challenge arises. So here's where we're gonna set them up for success. If you, you say what you're gonna do and you're gonna do what you're gonna say and it's gonna say it in the policy. One policy that every library must have to meet public library accreditation standards is the collection development policy. A collection development policy covers the criteria that the staff is using to select and purchase materials. So what we're including in the collection and what we're not. How these materials are managed, especially when, we, when they're weeded from the collection or withdrawn. And how do you handle questions or complaints about an item in the collection? So first, a complaint or a question isn't a bad thing in and of itself. My colleague and ILA president, Sam Helmick, reminds me all the time that petitioning your government, including a public library, is a right and a privilege of Americans. And so I just also mentioned the weeding policy. You're, the staff of the library are always reconsidering an item in the collection. Is the information out of date? Is it being used? Is it in poor condition? One way to approach those complaints is having a reconsideration of materials process. A reconsideration process is a formal procedure in which the library takes a written complaint Sometimes there's a form to fill out. And then if they follow the steps to reevaluate an item's inclusion in the collection. So that reconsideration should say who's part of the process. It could just be staff, it could be board of trustee members, it could be members of the community. I've seen a lot of different ways that these are, um, that the committee is put together. How is the process handled? It's important to take every reconsideration request seriously so that uh, the public feels heard. 
But when you're making those decisions, you really wanna take the rights of the whole community into consideration and making sure that you're following those policies, you're meeting your values and your principles as an institution. I say this um, as my library does not have a reconsideration policy. Our collection development policy specifically says we just don't remove books from the collection. So that's an option for you. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, how's that worked for us? Okay. <laughs> um, there's other policies to consider too when you're looking at intellectual freedom issues. I recommend reviewing your bylaws as a governing board, especially what are your meetings rules of order? How long is your public comment period and how is that structured? Because if you don't have that written down, you might spend hours with one person um, about one topic and you will never get onto your, your normal order of business. You wanna just make sure that you're able to say, you have five minutes to talk about this thing and then the five minutes are over. And then you have to enforce it. That's the other thing. If it's the policy, it needs to be enforced. Another thing, another pol policy is to consider uh, if you have meeting room uses, meeting rooms, you might wanna have a meeting room use policy. So who can use your meeting rooms and what types of meetings and activities can take place there? It could be for civic organizations or nonprofits. If you have a community display, you also might wanna have that same type of policy. So how it, what's the purpose of the display space and how can it be used? Internet use is another policy required by the state. When you're looking at that, what are the rules of use? And after someone has completed a computer session or no longer using that computer, how are you protecting their privacy and confidentiality when they walk away from the computer? And then another uh, policy to consider just because it is important for intellectual freedom issues is a privacy and confidentiality policy. What information do you keep and how long do you keep it? Another aspect of preparation is being actively engaged with intellectual freedom issues. So uh, following intellectual freedom issues in public and school libraries across the state and throughout the country, I, another a big kind of a big picture one is just following the bills that are going through the Iowa State Legislature. So the ILA's bill tracker on their website is a great resource for that. The ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom highlights a number of cases and they put out a report every Banned Books Week that gives an overview of what has happened throughout the country. Every Library USA is also a great resource. And then it's in the news, so different news outlets are following these stories too. You're already doing this one, you're participating in, for, in training, so participate in further training. The United for Libraries website has some great webinars and training guides. State Library has courses as well. And other state libraries have videos readily available too. I'll call out Massachusetts Library Systems for some great videos because they just did a partnership with ALA to, um, to make some training available to the Massachusetts libraries. And it's free to everybody across the country. It's just on their website. And then another one that I really highly recommend is just talking through the process as a board or ask your staff to run through a practice book challenge or any intellectual freedom challenge and see how the staff walks through the steps of of reconsidering a collection item or reconsidering, reconsidering offering a program. We talked about how these situations are fast and they can be frightening and they can be stressful. And I just wanna mention that your library staff needs your support, especially during these times. Do this by communicating openly and regularly with your library director and actively ask how your staff is doing. But my most important advice that I wanna give is you need to trust your captain and you need to trust your crew. Follow your policies, stick to the role that you've given yourself in these issues. Do not take on evaluating the merits of a book on your own. If you do this, you walked away from your policies. You've walked away from the standards that you had in place and your library's integrity could suffer. Which brings me to my next point you want to choose a spokesperson. If you are in a very public heated challenge, you want the library to speak as one. That spokesperson can be the director, can be the board president, and they can handle media requests for comments and they can stay on message. What you don't want is just a variety of voices saying totally different things within the same board.
And then lastly, be an advocate for intellectual freedom. The trustee manual from the State Library calls out that you are a defender of intellectual freedom. Perhaps it is time to get ahead and speak for its value before a challenge comes your way. So here's a couple ways to do this. One is your community organization. You have a lot of partnerships in your community. community. You work with people. So tell them, tell your community and find those people in your community that you've worked with or, at, or that they just advocate for similar values and let them know the importance of your library and intellectual freedom. Speak at community and service groups, go to city council or, your gov or, the, or county commissioner meetings, write a statement, it can be that simple. And then very importantly, tell your state legislators, meet with them or give them a call watch for legislation on this issue and provide comments during that comment period. There's several coming through the pipeline right now. There's a great opportunity on March 7th, which is ILA Advocacy Day. It's from 12 to 2 p.m. in the State Capitol Law Library in Des Moines. I hope to see you there. And then talk to your local media or write a letter to the editor. So if you do some of that front end work, if a challenge comes to you, you have let the community know that you value intellectual freedom already in the work that the library does. And so you can speak to, they'll, they'll know what to expect when they, when they request, when they have a challenge. They won't, um, it's just important. They'll know that you'll wanna protect this important democratic value. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna take a little bit of a deep breath before we get into questions. So I know in the moment of a challenge, it's really hard to keep in mind that this will be over, but um, things, things do end. So it's important to know that they'll eventually resolve, especially if you stay the course. If you trust your captain, you trust your crew, you follow your policies, if you maintain your institutional values, you stick to your roles, you'll come out on the other side, perhaps even a stronger library. Mm -hmm. So before I get into questions, I just also want to just state that I, we've, I've mentioned a lot of resources, including United for Libraries, the State Library Trustee Manual, the Protecting Intellectual Freedom. Again, I will, we will send a book list to every registrant. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was a really great overview of intellectual freedom for all of our trustees. Again, just to repeat, this uh, webinar is Iowa-based and Iowa-specific. So uh, if you are watching this later or currently here visiting or viewing from a state other than Iowa, you also have some of the resources that we might have mentioned that are specific to Iowa available in your state as well. So if you are in a different uh, State, you will have a state library association, a or a regional library association, a state library, um, and your employees, the, the employees at your library will have good ideas of where to get more information, what are the applicable laws for you. Um, there were a couple things that I thought of um, while Anne was talking and I'll just say we will be taking questions in the chat. So if you would like to submit something, we will take those as they come. Um, but while we're waiting for folks to chime in, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Iowa Library Association and the challenges that we've seen in the last year or so. Um, as Anne mentioned, we've had an unprecedented number of challenges. Often we wouldn't have more than one or two challenges reported to us during a year. Uh, last year, we had over 50 challenges reported to us. Um, and some of those were a little bit tricky. They came from a slightly different angle. So often we encounter challenges or requests for reconsideration um, where someone comes across the title, is upset that it's a part of their library collection, and asks the board to consider removing it or labeling it or placing it in a different part of the library. Um, but we've also seen an uptick in challenges where uh, an individual re will request that an item be added to the collection. And um, when staff 
after their own vetting and decision making decide not to include that material for whatever reason, then that is the decision that is brought to the board for reconsideration. So um, we've helped, Iowa Library Association has helped at least two libraries deal with that specific situation where a periodical was uh, requested and not added on the advice of staff, um, but there was a request for reconsideration of that decision. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat. Is it okay for a library board to get together privately to prepare for a challenge? Would this be a violation of open meetings laws? I am not a lawyer. I am not a part of the public information board. <laughs> My understanding is um, that so long as you are not uh, engaging in library business, you should be okay. However, I would not recommend it. Um, if you're going to have these conversations, uh, opportunities like this uh, are a great way to do that. Um, you can incorporate discussions about continuing education, uh, things like this webinar or articles that you've read into your um, into your public meetings. Uh, you can have non-quorum meetings, of course, if you know two or three of you were to get together, depending on the size of your board, of course. Um, I would I would caution against getting together without publishing, um, even if you think it will be okay. <laughs> um, I tend to err on the side of caution when it comes to open meetings laws, because if you were to have a conversation where you talk about how you you don't really believe that any book should ever be removed from a library collection, and then a challenge comes before you, and the discussion bears that out. It could be seen as you having like before the issue even came up, um, having a, a conversation about it and making a decision outside of a public meeting in advance. And that would not go well for you. Uh, so there's very, very specific criteria to be able to go in a closed session. So I don't know if that would meet the, I don't think it would meet the criteria to go into a closed session. But I would, as Amanda said, we're not lawyers. So I would say that I would contact the state library, Mandy Easter to ask, or your district representative um, at the state library just to, to figure out if that's, okay. Yeah, Ma Marianne Mori is here and she is yes. answering the question for us, which is do not do this. Um, we are lucky to have Marianne Mori who is a <laughs> consultant you. for the State Library of Iowa here. Uh, he says, do not get together and, uh, yeah, have those conversations in advance. Amanda, if I can just chime in. Sure. Um, some of you may have a quorum for educational purposes, and that typically could be okay. But as Amanda was saying, it, somebody could accuse you of violating open meetings, chapter 21. So it's always, always best to post a, an agenda if you're meeting for any reason. And the example that was posted here was we're going to meet to prepare, to make decisions about how we're going to react. And those are making decisions. And that definitely would constitute a meeting and would not um, qualify for not posting an agenda. It does not meet the criteria for a closed session. There are, I think it's 12 reasons, only two of which typically apply to public libraries. And this is not one of those reasons. And I would just jump on to what Marianne, Marianne said. You know, if you're getting together, let's say, you know, we seem to have the uh, a group of Ames Public Library and Library trustees all together in a room watching this. It's for continuing education purposes. Maybe they posted, maybe they didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're getting together for strictly continuing education, yeah, I would still post. I think it's still, uh, it's better to be more transparent. Um, but yeah, preparing for the potential of a challenge to review, you know, your policy and your procedure is different than we expect to receive a challenge. Um, but again, just I would err on the side of caution. And you can have individual meetings with your your library director um, or with your library staff. Um, yeah, you have options. But if you're going to have something resembling a quorum or a rolling quorum, I would I would post. Uh, we had another question in the chat. Are there organized challenge efforts from groups such as Moms for Liter Li Liberty, et cetera? Yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, 
a lot of challenges and I don't have any statistics to talk about um, like what percentage of these challenges are coming from groups like this. Um, but there, there are a lot of groups out there who are educating their members on how to go about engaging in a challenge in their library, in their communities, uh, and providing them with materials that they think should be challenged and talking points for, you know, what to complain about and how to make noise and how to, you know, put, you know, trustees in the hot seat on um, why a particular material is included. So. Um, Yes, there are a lot of groups. It's not just, you know, the local Moms for Liberty. There, um, there are a lot of national groups that are doing this. And you can see that just based on the lists, like that 500 list, I, 500 book list I referenced is something that's going around state by state. And not everybody could have the same um, 500 book list. It just, yeah, it, so it would be a huge coincidence that, that individual members would just like the same 500 books. And if you are, uh, if your library receives a request for reconsideration form, it might have just an individual's name on it, and you may or may not know that they have, you know, the backing, formally or informally, of a group like this. So often, um, a request for reconsideration form will ask for some information about whether it's um, an individual or a group who is petitioning for the removal of this. Um, one thing we've also seen a lot of recently is um, either individuals challenging a huge number of items, as Anne said, or a large number of individuals challenging a particular title. So there was a library in Iowa last year that received 17 identical challenges from different members of their community, all for the same title. So one thing that you should in consider including in your reconsideration policy um is what to do in those situations also you might find that you your board is subject to repeat challenges so someone is unhappy with the way that the challenge unfolded the decision that the board made or the reconsideration committee made and the board accepted uh, and so someone just comes back the next month and challenges it so there are options for how to restrict challenges that you might receive um, you are answerable to the residents of your service area. So you can restrict challenges to people who live only, only those who live or own property in your service area. Um, you can say that, you know, unless there is a significant change to the policy under which this was reconsidered, we won't uh, entertain a challenge again for a certain amount of time, be that six months, one year, two years. Um, and that just kind of insulates you from um, wasting a lot of time and a lot of staff time or community members time. If you if your policy says that you have to go through the entire process every time. Um, so I would encourage you to find some restrictions that you can put into your policy just to, to protect your the, the load on your staff. Um, one other thing, uh, Anne was talking about public comment in your meetings, and I just wanted to remind uh, trustees that you are allowed to amend your um, public comment rules at any meeting. So if you generally allow three minutes for public comment and you know 30 minutes or 15 minutes or something in a standard meeting, you have 75 people show up, you could instead say, we're going to have everyone's going to get 90 seconds and we're going to allow a lot more time or a shorter amount of time. Um, I would caution against restricting too much just because as Anne said, you know, these folks have a right to speak to you and to bring their concerns to you as a public board member. Um, you can also um, attempt to have uh, representative groups uh, in your public comment. So if you have a for and against group, you know, take a few from this side, a few from that side, but then people are required to self-identify ahead of time. So um, having a good procedure for how you take public comment, public comment is also advisable. Um, looking in the chat, yes, Marianne makes a good point of the public information board, Iowa Public Information Board is very helpful. Um, 
Uh, another question, what arguments are challengers making? So the trends in material challenges right now are that stories by and about LGBTQ uh, people and people of color are by far the most challenged. So what we're seeing is, um, I mean, I'm, we have, I assume we have all heard the librarians as groomers uh, phrase. There's a lot of pushback against depictions of LGBT relationships, um, of depictions of sexual violence in materials. We're seeing that, um, I think one example of that is the, the memoir, All Boys Aren't Blue. Um, I personally take a lot of offense at um, trying to restrict individual stories. Not that any story should be restricted, obviously, but um, especially when it's an individual telling their true life story and people saying that it's inappropriate for children, teens, whoever, to read and learn about that when that's the real lived life experience of someone who was that age. I just find that incredibly frustrating personally. Um, also, just concerns about normalizing uh, LGBT existence and um, the idea that, you know, children's brains are very flexible and they learn all kinds of things and they might learn to be gay, which is seen to be a negative by some people. Um, so. There are also, there are a lot of other reasons why people challenge things. Um, a colleague of mine um, in another state was dealing with a challenge from a staff member because they felt that the depictions um, of a, a certain people group in a certain book was inaccurate. Um, and so they were dealing with um, how to balance accurate, accuracy of information from one person's perspective against the entire collection. Um, so there, there are all kinds of reasons why people challenge, but primarily um, they have to do with LGBT uh, and BIPOC uh, stories and authors. If a challenger does not reside in our library district, do they have standing to make a challenge and is the board obligated to respond to such a challenge? this is where your policy is going to be really, really, uh, really important. And I think that it is important to run a restriction on this type of thing past your uh, local uh, legal expert. So I would suggest saying, you know, we do not take reconsideration requests from people who live outside of our service area who are not the people who are part of our community who we serve. Um, but, you know, that is complicated in some ways by the fact that we have reciprocal borrowing in Iowa through the open access program, um, or maybe someone, you know, lives in one area, but they buy a full service card. So there, there are a lot of intricacies there that would need to be worked out. Um, I think that if, your policy does not restrict those challenges, then you really should entertain them, uh, which is just a good reason to restrict them. Yep, it's a good time to look at the policies. <laughs> <laughs> One other suggestion that I really want to make and that I try to make in all of my intellectual freedom presentations is um, your library board, your library director should have a relationship of some sort with an outside legal expert who deals in intellectual freedom issues. Um, all of us library directors are um, very used to hearing, you should check with your city attorney, you should check with your county attorney. And the vast majority of the time that is going to be the right answer. But I would say no attorney is an expert in everything. Um, also, should it come down to you know, your city council versus the library, your your city attorney answers to your city council. They don't answer to you. And they probably have a much better working relationship with the city council and your local police than they do with you. 
and I'm not trying to make it sound like, you know, your lawyer, your city attorney isn't going to do their best. Um, but there are excellent First Amendment attorneys out there. Um, you can have them consult for a single hour on a policy that your library has. Um, and then you are their client. And um, I just highly recommend and having someone outside of your city structure um, as someone who dealt with this with a city who was unsupportive during a challenge personally um, having backup outside of the city structure even if it's just someone who's going to confirm that your your city attorney is doing the right thing um, that's really valuable um, and you can talk you can even ask your current city attorney do you have recommendations uh, it doesn't have to be a I need someone who's not you. It could just be, I need another opinion from someone who has more uh, expertise in this area. The ACLU might be a good resource too to find lawyers for that as well. Yes. Um, uh, Michael Giudeschi is a, an attorney in Des Moines and I cannot recall uh, which firm he works for. But when I asked the ACLU of Iowa for a recommendation, that is who they pointed me towards. Um, uh, we have another question. Regarding displays, to what extent should we consider the demographic makeup of the community? For instance, we have a large Amish community in our area and they are significant users of the library. I think that um, My response to this would be you should have displays and, you know, through not every single display, but through all of your displays, and I hope that that becomes clear, um, that you should be serving members of your, all the members of your community. So you might put up a display that really resonates with one portion of your community uh, and maybe just isn't of interest to another portion of your community. Um, but you should have displays that, you know, over the course of the, the next few months, the next year or so, that you're hitting all the demographics in your area. So you want it to be viewed from an inclusive, you know, are we appealing to everyone as opposed to, um, is there anyone who's gonna be upset about this? At kind of an exclusive view of doing displays. <laughs> Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions for us or anything else they would like to highlight? Um, Again, I'll just mention the, um, the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom is an invaluable resource. Um, they are currently putting together the 2023 statistics. They will be announced uh, at the end of April during National Library Week for the number of challenges, and they will uh, announce the annual top 10 most challenged titles uh, that were reported to them. But um, I also wanted to mention that the vast majority of challenges go unreported. Uh, the current estimate is that 80 to 90 percent of challenges are unreported. Um, as I said at the beginning, the Iowa Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Committee is available to offer direct support to library workers who are going through a challenge, um, but they have to let us know that they need help first. So a lot of policies, another thing you can put in your policy is that if you have a challenge, it gets reported to ILA and to ALA. Uh, both of us have forms where you can uh, submit, be it anonymously uh, or with identifying information, you can request assistance uh, or not if you've got a good handle on it. Um, challenges, challenge reports come to us at all different stages. So whether it's, um, I can I can see this bubbling in my community and I would like to be prepared. What can I do now? Uh, all the way through to Okay, three months ago, we had a whole bunch of challenges. Uh, we worked our way through them, but for statistical purposes, we're just gonna let you know that we handled it. Um, and while often these challenges do, you know, they, they come and they go, 
sometimes they linger. Sometimes you get a, a patron who is um, who just won't won't let go of the issue for one reason or another. Or a challenge begets other challenges. Once people realize that challenging challenging materials is an option in your community, um, they might it you know it might influence other folks to uh, challenge items as well. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to highlight. <laughs> and anything else? Any last parting comments? No, thank you for having me. There was another question that just what, about books with factual errors that just came through. And um, one thing I will say is we weed, there's there's two parts to that. One is that, yeah, we weed things quite a bit when we're looking through to make sure that information is accurate. So if we're talking about health information or travel information, you wanna make sure that, that, that the things that you have on your shelf are up to date. That's getting harder now. Um, there's a lot of new publishers out there uh, a lot of controversial knowledge and it's starting to be a little bit of a fine line that I don't have a perfect answer for or a good answer for because we're kind of grappling with that too. Do we buy these books when we know that either it's a political issue or even a health issue that may be inaccurate, but it is a it is a belief like and you're trying to serve a specific segment of your community. So I don't have a very good answer for that, but um, that's something you should probably think about when you're policy and kind of think about your community when you're purchasing materials. That's a good point. I know that I've had uh, conversations with uh, just friends of mine, you know, who who is the arbiter of truth? Who gets to determine what truth is uh, and how it's represented? Um, do people have a right to engage with the information that they want, even if that information is flawed in maybe the professional view. Do people have a right to be uninformed? And um, yeah, it's it's a very, it's a really difficult line to walk. I would agree with Anne. We, you know, we try to make sure that our information is as accurate as possible, but there's no way for us to, to guarantee that. There's no way for us to, you know, flag material. So, you know, when Pluto was deemed no longer a planet, you know, all of a sudden, all these publishers put out new books. Well, we can't necessarily afford to replace your whole collection on Pluto, but it's also not our job to go in and, you know, with our little Sharpie and fix content. Uh, so it is, yeah, it can be tricky and it is very situationally dependent. Um, and yes, Lisa makes a good point. It's important to be able to determine the difference between facts and opinion, but uh, again, people have different views of what facts are and what opinions are. Um, I would also just make you all aware, I think that a lot of librarians facing challenges are feeling the, um, the efforts to deprofessionalize uh, the career that we have. So a lot of professional librarians um, have advanced degrees. Um, so not just, you know, 10 or 12 years of on-the-job training, but a master's degree in library and information science where you learn about all of these things. Um, but just like in so many other fields, I feel like I see, we, we see this a lot in the medical field as well. You know, um, you might have a degree, but I can research too. And, and this is the information I've found and I don't need to trust you because I know better than you. And that can be really frustrating to deal with um, from all kinds of perspectives. Um, but it's it's an extra challenge to um, to argue why we do the things that we do. You know, things like the American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights. There's nothing legally binding about that. Our Code of Ethics. There's nothing legally binding about that. You might adopt those into your policies and use them as guiding documents, and we use them as as um, professional, you know, guideposts uh, for ourselves and and how we like to perform our professional duties. Um, but yeah, what is the law and what is professional ethics um, and what is our own job knowledge and experience? Those are all different things, but uh, we try, we do the best that we can, I would say. I think, um, hmm. 
Marianne Mori coming in clutch again with another <laughs> comment for us. The ALA Library Bill of Rights has been used by Supreme Court cases uh, potentially up to 30 times, according to her recollection of what our law librarian, Mandy Easter, has said. Um, go Iowa. So, yeah, go Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, last but not least, thank you all again so much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your commitment to being an effective and well-informed trustee of your community library. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, some events in the future. Uh, if you're, any of you are in the North Liberty area towards the end of the month of April, Intellectual Freedom Committee is partnering with the ACLU of Iowa to do a National Library Week slash delayed band books week trivia night so if you are interested in joining us for that uh, you can look for some information but also if you're in iowa and you're a trustee the annual conference happens every year in october it's going to be in dubuque this year so come visit us uh we'll try to have some other great sessions for you and uh you know maybe go say something nice to your library staff and your library director uh they deserve it and as do you of course so again thank you have a great night